Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering remote workers, key strategies for employers to reduce legal risk. I'm Katie Kreider, marketing specialist here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full service human capital management company. We offer a complete suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service, and deep HR and payroll expertise. At NP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm excited to introduce your presenter for today's program, Stephanie C. Schwartz. Stephanie has devoted her legal career to representing employers in all aspects of employment law, including discrimination, harassment, retaliation, and wrongful, wrongful termination. Stephanie did, dedicates herself to counseling her clients and ensuring that proper and effective employment policies are in place, as well as assisting in the hiring, firing, and disciplining of employees. Stephanie's expertise is also called upon to conduct internal investigations in a timely and efficient manner. Stephanie has represented hundreds of clients in state and federal court proceedings, arbitration proceedings, and before administration agencies such as Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights. She has several reported cases and has been successful with jury and non-jury trials. From 2012 to the present, Stephanie has been named to the New York Jersey super lawyers list in the area of labor and employment law. Furthermore, in 2015, she was named to the New Jersey Top 50 Women Lawyers by the Super Lawyers Publication. Stephanie is an active member of the legal and non-legal community, serving on many boards and committees for nonprofit organizations, banks, and professional associations. Hatfield Schwartz Law Group is a women-owned law firm located in Northern New Jersey with a practice centered labor and employment law. Founded by Stephanie C. Schwartz and Catherine V. Hatfield in 2020, the firm provides dedicated personal attention to each of their valued clients. Hatfield Schwartz was created with the mission to focus on client issues and determine innovative solutions with an unparalleled level of quality. They develop proactive business solutions, assisting their clients with all their legal needs. For more information, including how to contact them, please visit www.hatfieldschwartzlaw.com. Just a few housekeeping issues before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will be sending out the recording of the webinar later today along with the slides. And with that, I'm gonna hand the mic off to Stephanie. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward uh, to presenting today. Um, you know, when I was asked to do this topic, I, I, I thought to myself, wow, we are in such a different place than when I first started practicing law, which was a healthy 25 plus years ago. Um, 25 plus years ago, um, we had to come into the office every day. If you wanted to uh, conduct research or to meet with someone, uh, you had to drive the 30 minutes. In fact, I lived an hour and a half away from the office to make sure that I got to the office to, to meet with the managing partner. Well, times have certainly changed. Um, in fact, roughly 4.7 4 million employees are remote workers. That is 3.4% of the United States workforce work from home. Since 2010, we saw a 400% increase of people that are working remotely. And obviously since 2020, since the pandemic, remote workers increased even more. So what does this mean? Does this mean that um, the HR policies are going to have to change? Uh, does it mean that we are going to have to treat our employees any different? What are remote work options? Um, what about the leaves? How does sick time apply? How does wage and hour laws apply? Uh, you know, what about confidential and security? 
Uh, we all read the news and the data breach and cybersecurity. Obviously, that's a presentation for another day. But how do we make sure that our employees who are doing their work for us as employers continue to maintain the confidentiality and the security that we expect? How about harassment, discrimination? Does that still exist because um, the employees are no longer walking through our doors? Um, what about performance feedback, discipline? Out of state workers, expenses, what are the other considerations that we might have to think about now that employees, for the most part, are either working from home permanently or working from home in some hybrid fashion? Um, you know, I'm sure we could all think to ourselves, I've had conversations with many people, it doesn't matter about the age of the person. And I say, do you like working remote? And I will say probably about 50% of the people say, I love it. And then they pause and they say, well, not necessarily all the time. And I think to myself, well, what are we missing now that we have most people that are working remote or in a hybrid? Well, they have the same benefit of learning from an elder states person. Will they have the same benefit of learning about the trade? Will networking events, will relationships continue um, the way that it once was in 2000 when, when you were always going to work? How has this changed? What is the workplace going to be like in 2024? How about what's the workplace gonna be like in 2030? Uh, these are all interesting topics. In 2028, I saw a statistic that 73% of all teams will have some level of remote work. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that our employment laws and our protections remain constant. Because just because that person is not walking through your brick and mortar place, you still have to make sure that there are the same levels of protections for those employees. So, we're gonna hit on some of these topics um, as best as we can. And um, as um, if there's any questions, please put it in the Q&A and I hope to get to it at the end of the presentation. So remote work policies, work from home, hybrid policies. We need to make sure that everyone has a clear policy regarding the parameters and expectations. What should this include? Should include perhaps effective dates of the remote, remote work option? should include whether that job description permits employees to be hybrid or fully remote. How about if it's hybrid? Should we make sure that we have in writing how many days will be in and how many days will be out? Maybe there's flexible days, maybe there's specific days. Maybe every Monday there's a team meeting that everyone's required to go to. The most common model has employees working from home on Monday and Friday and coming to the office on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Is that good enough for you? So the idea is to create a policy and to make sure there's full transparency, to make sure that every employee knows their expectations um, that you as the employer have of each person. How about the remote work option? Is it discretionary or can it be changed at every, any time? I would advise everyone that when they put a policy in writing to make sure that they have that caveat on the bottom so that the employee knows that it may, may change with some notice. I also think that policies need to have an expectation for everyone's work performance and productivity. I'm an attorney, right? So I don't create widgets. However, we have, as everyone knows, billable time. So what's the requirement of the billable hours? Making sure that that's in writing and everyone knows what their expectation is as an employee. How about expectations for response time? Um, you know, as we all like to say, when the pandemic hit, the boundaries be eliminated. And, and I'm sure we all realize that. So what are your expectations for your employees? When should they be, be able to respond? Is it still a nine to five job? Is it an 830 job? Do you expect them to be on camera all the time? Do you expect the green dot to be there all the time? Again, are there times that you're going to require them to be on camera? Are there times that you're not going to require them to be on camera? How about reimbursement for equipment and business expenses, if any? Again, these policies need to make sure that they all are spelled out, 
the handbook, which we used to make sure that it had leave and which it's still going to have leave and harassment, still going to have harassment, still going to have discrimination, anti-discrimination policies. Perhaps the policies now need to make sure that they, in the handbook, that we make sure that we elaborate on the expectations, the reimbursement for equipment. How about the protection of the confidential information? Um, so it is important that the policies that we create are disseminated to our staff and make sure they are clear, they are unambiguous, and they are not discriminatory in any way. It's important to analyze what work can be done remotely, right? And what criteria should be applied when selecting which employees can work remotely. Not everyone can work remotely. They're, not every person can have a job that they can work remote. And that's important. And so long as you treat everyone the same within that job category, you're not discriminated against someone. The criteria should be objective, it should be based on legitimate business reasons, and it should just be applied consistently to avoid any claims of illegal discrimination or retaliation, as well as just complaints about unfair or unfavorable or favorable treatment. So if an employee does not have a remote option or certain employees must be on site full time, when, when must you as an employer consider permitting an employee to work remotely? Well, there's lots of laws out there. Um, and the one that I put um, in this slide is the Americans with Disability Act. Now, there's many state laws that are analogous to the ADA, um, but I'm gonna use the ADA in this situation. And again, depending on the size of your company, certain laws apply and certain laws don't apply. But the most important aspect of when someone asks if they can work remote is whether or not that is a reasonable accommodation. If they, for example, have a handicap or there's a perceived handicap and they need to work remote. What are you as an employer must do? You must engage in the interactive process. Even if at the end of the day, you're going to say, no, this job function cannot be performed at home. You need to sit down and have an interactive meeting. And again, when I say sit down, it can be via Zoom or remote um, and have a interactive discussion with the employee as to why they think they need the remote option. Just because a doctor provides a note saying my uh, patient needs to work from home or just because the employee says, I'd like to work from home, that does not necessarily mean that the employee employer must provide that accommodation to the employee. But it is very, very important that you follow the, what the law says that we need to do and have the interactive process so that we can analyze whether or not that person can be reasonably accommodated. The key is whether or not um, working from home changes the essential function of the job. And that's what the law says. And if it does, then you don't necessarily have to provide that accommodation. So again, it's, it's the, the, what we need to consider are the facts uh, of each job, each job responsibility, um, and what they're doing for the employer. So hypothetical, what occurs if an employee uh, is diagnosed with COVID, but is not symptomatic and feels well enough to work? So even their temporary remote working, the employee must quarantine and therefore remain out of the workplace in, a current, in accordance with the current guidelines. Obviously, these guidelines are consistently and constantly changing. I remember back in uh, when the pandemic first hit, every, every morning I would wake up and go to the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, their website, or the CDC website, uh, and read about the updated guidelines that it felt like it was coming at us fast and furiously uh, daily. Um, so we need to make sure um, that we are providing our employees uh, with time off consistent with the current guidelines. Um, what happens if an employee must travel for work to a high risk area and the employer wants the employee to quarantine for a period of time upon the return? Again, if the job can be performed remotely, consider allowing the employee to work remotely. Um, you know, these are temporary remote work options um, and these requests must, um, when the requests come in, uh, when you're considering them, uh, again, it is um, 
it is favorable that you consider everyone equally and, and fairly. Um, so you treat everyone the same so that a discrimination claim does not arise from one certain um, sector of the workforce versus another. Um, so you have, must consider um, all these requests and the temporary work and the permanent remote work um, on an as needed basis, ongoing, fact sensitive, um, sit down, make sure HR, employment council, and everyone is on the same page. Because again, I think what has gotten most of the employers in trouble is not, not permitting, but treating people different. Um, and when you treat someone different, um, and it's not based upon the job uh, functions or the job description, uh, that is when the discrimination uh, and retaliation lawsuits uh, come into play. But kind of pivot a bit to sick time, leave, wage and hour um, policies. So the sick leave laws, um, again, every state has different sick leave laws um, and they're based upon the state where the employee uh, may be working remotely. Um, some state laws actually require employers to provide sick leave to all employees, regardless of where the employee is working from. For example, um, I'm gonna say in New Jersey, employees working remotely are entitled to sick time under the New Jersey law, regardless of where the employee is working, whether in the office or remotely in New Jersey or remotely out of the state. What does your handbook say? What happens if you are a multi-state employer? Um, do you have seven different handbooks um, for uh, each place uh, of where the, 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 the person is working? Um, or do you have one general handbook which addresses uh, each and every state? And these are definitely considerations uh, that must be uh, taken. Similarly, employers need to understand the family and medical leave laws. Uh, not only the federal family medical leave laws, but the state family and medical leave laws where the employees are located or where they're working from. Again, for example, in New Jersey, employees are still entitled to leave under the New Jersey uh, Family Leave Act um, if that employee is working remotely from New Jersey or even remotely out of state. Keep in mind um, that many of these laws um, uh, have threshold requirements um, not only about how many employees are, are um, uh, within the employer, um, but also um, how long the employee has been working uh, for the one employer. So not everyone is entitled to um, the family leave, um, whether it's federal or state. There are certain threshold requirements that must be met by both the employee as well as um, the employer. All in, um, employers should consider reviewing all the current policies, um, considering maybe vacation um, and other PTO. I know a lot of employers are moving to the PTO um, days instead of um, saying these are vacation and these are sick days. And so long as the PTO days um, are consistent with the law and you give, remember the law is the floor, not the ceiling. So, so long as the policies provide the employees with at least the minimum that is required by the state, then at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you call them, um, they are entitled to them. I find it um, with remote um, workers um, that um, many people were questioning, um, especially during the pandemic, um, should they be changing their policies? not only um, for uh, PTO, but also about accrual, when some, uh, someone is entitled to accrue their time off, and also whether or not someone and the employees should be able to carry over um, the, the vacation and or PTO days. Um, when that pandemic first hit, um, many people were uh, working from home and vacation slash PTO, whatever it was, um, was not being taken in the same manner um, that it was taken pre the pandemic. So many of my clients questioned whether or not they should roll over uh, and allow the employees to continue to use those unused um, PTO days. Um, so what many of my clients did was um, modified and did an addendum to their handbook for a, a specific period of time that allowed the employees to use 
um, their time off um, only up until let's just say 2022. And then after 2022, it revert back to um, the existing policy that was in place. So again, taking a look at what this, the time off, uh, what the sick time, the leave time, um, what they have uh, in the handbook um, is very important. I know also many employers want, it did not want to be able to um, give time off in hourly segments anymore. They either wanted uh, full days um, or half days. So again, um, it's something of a consideration and you know, making sure that it's clear, it's unambiguous, uh, and that everyone is treated the same. Um, employers certainly have carte blanche to do what they need to do so long, again, it's not violating um, any of the leave laws. So taking a look at the leave laws is uh, quite important. Um, a couple of years ago, New Jersey changed the threshold, as we were talking about, for their medical leave uh, from 50, which is federal, down to 30. Again, um, quite, quite important um, to make sure that everyone is, is familiar with the laws that are in place. Um, let's just go over to now wage and hour uh, considerations, exempt uh, versus non-exempt employees, right? Exempt, non-exempt. Um, what happens if someone is entitled to overtime um, and they, uh, they fall in the classification um, and uh, now all of a sudden we're not being able to um, properly document or record their overtime. So again, um, if someone's working remote, they're not in the office, um, we need to make sure that their record keeping is still the same as it was when everyone um, was in the office so that we uh, can prevent the violations of both federal and state overtime laws. What does that mean? It means making sure that everyone's job description has on it exempt or non-exempt, meaning they're entitled or not entitled to the overtime. Requiring employees to record all their hours worked, setting forth clear work hours, um, expressly prohibiting off the clock work, I'll call it that, um, and making sure as a requirement that employees obtain permission before working overtime. Um, and whether it's emailing um, the HR manager and the supervisor um, or just one person, making sure that everyone um, is, again, knows when it is asked, um, there also needs to be a response saying, yes, you may work overtime. Just because an employee asked to work overtime does not necessarily, that means obtaining permission. Um, I'm just going to stop for a second and just say that, you know, I also do some um, uh, litigation uh, is my other hat besides the HR counseling. Um, and I'm, I'm risk adverse, so I, I try to stay out of the, the courtroom. However, um, I have a case um, right now. And one of, and I'm going to say one of the defenses um, is that the handbook was so large, how could she have read everything? Uh, look, it's, it's a very interesting defense. I'm not quite sure it's going to be a viable defense, um, but, but it, it made me think that yes, um, many companies have handbooks that are a hundred pages long or in that, maybe we should make sure that we take a look at it uh, and make sure that the policies that we don't need in there come out and make sure those policies that are changing if they change on an annual basis, those are the ones that are highlighted so that everyone knows these are the modified policies. Um, so again, um, reviewing the policies um, is, is um, and making sure um, that the policies are set forth in the handbook or an addendum or is sent out to, set to the employees is um, quite important. Employers have to be familiar with the Fair Labor Standards Act. Again, what we discussed, exempt, non-exempt. Um, there's um, some laws out there, and the FLSA does not mandate a meal or rest break, but many state laws do, so there's a difference. Um, is it 30 minutes? Um, is it 30 minutes unpaid? Are you gonna give them an hour and pay them for the other 30 minutes? Um, you know, again, are you going to enforce these policies or revise them for remote workers? Um, you know, I know that many of my clients want uh, their employees to take a break. They want them to take a break, though, during designated times, uh, and they it varies. So not everyone is, uh, you know, off screen 
uh, from 1230 to 130. You're entitled to uh, mandate and put in place when employees, certain employees should take a lunch hour or a lunch half hour. So again, there is nothing unlawful about that, um, but making sure that it works best for you as the employer. And you know, not, not one book fits everyone. Um, you need to make sure that um, it is consistent with the culture uh, and consistent with the type of uh, employer um, that you are. Confidentiality, security. Um, wow, if one doesn't uh, exist, you need to create one. Um, we need to make sure that employees understand uh, the importance of maintaining confidentiality um, and what are the best practices that should be followed. Not only should this be in writing, um, but I consider having a meeting with all employees to verbally convey this as well. What's important? It's important that they understand that they should work in private spaces, uh, not at the local coffee shop. Um, they should um, be reminded that any documents that are printed on paper should be maintained uh, in a confidential secure place so that others don't have access. Um, they should be reminded um, that uh, any documents should be shredded and not just thrown in the kitchen garbage can. Um, we should remind employees not to send uh, sensitive employer data to personal email. Um, again, you know, we didn't really necessarily think about that when we we're sitting in an office with everyone, um, but now um, it should be spelled out and should everyone should be reminded. Um, how about the laptop that's home now? Um, you know, no more have desktops, everyone has laptops. Should I let my seven-year-old um, play on that laptop? Um, and so we should remind employees that family members um, or friends should not have access to the company device uh, and they should not be able to be um, logged in. So I think that um, it is extremely important so that everyone understands um, whether or not we're creating a widget, you're developing a widget, there's a trademark, um, what's proprietary, um, what's sensitive. Um, it, you know, if it is the employers and it makes the employer um, uh, survive, um, then it is sensitive and proprietary information. I'm not talking about in the legal sense. I'm talking about though, this is information that you don't want out in the public domain. Um, encourage your employees to utilize secure wireless uh, and internet net networks while working. Um, you know, the old, I remember traveling years and years ago, and everyone would say that if you went to the airport um, and you got on the network, that public network, uh, now all of a sudden there'll be people that be able to hack in um, to your computer because you're on a public network. Um, encourage them only to use the secure wireless. Um, even if it costs you as the employer um, some extra dollars, it's super important to make sure that that the information is, is secured. Um, make it clear that the use of equipment, software, the supplies is only limited to certain people um, and only used for company business. Um, work email accounts should only be used. And again, uh, work cell phones, if this is applicable, should also only be used. Encourage the employees to report anything um, that they think is suspicious to the ID department better be um, safe than sorry. Um, ensure that all the work computers and devices are password protected. Uh, ensure that you change the password. Um, some people uh, are encouraged to change it monthly, other change it every other month. Again, you know, avoid the public Wi-Fi and sending the sensitive data to the personal email accounts. Uh, all, you know, the, the, the handbooks used to have, and they still do, hopefully, um, they have a policy in there which talks about how um, the computers, the company's computers should not be used for personal use and that the company, uh, the employer, has full access um, to your email um, your work email, as well as your computers. That should still exist, um, but we should also make sure that we add in more verbiage in there for those remote workers. Um, and even those people that work from, doesn't have to be all the time, that they're hybrid, um, to make sure that um, the confidential and the proprietary information that you as the employers want to keep uh, remains that way. Discrimination, retaliation, anti-harassment, harassment. harassment. Um, what policies and procedures are in place? I remember when, again, when we first started working remote, um, uh, there was uh, a whole 
thought that there'll be an uptick uh, in harassment uh, cases um, because people that were working remote from their, their homes uh, wouldn't act um, the same way that they would um, in the place of employment. Now, I don't necessarily know if there's been an uptick of harassment, um, but um, because I think right off the box, everyone said, okay, um, where you're working, make sure that it is a clean space. And I don't mean clean as a neat, I mean that there shouldn't be things on the wall that sh would not be on the wall in your office um, that would make someone uncomfortable. Um, so, so, and, and the, the dress, and we all read and probably saw uh, some of those um, uh, uh, internet sensations that, you know, someone stood up and they weren't wearing pants on the bottom half. Yep, it happened. I don't think it happened as often as everyone thought that it was going to happen, um, because I think people uh, realized that um, this was here to stay. Um, but there's definitely lots of uh, laws out there. Title VII um, you know, protects uh, certain uh, individuals from discrimination, harassment. That's the federal uh, anti-discrimination and anti-harassment statute. Um, there are many state laws regarding discrimination and harassment and retaliation that are more liberal and broader than Title VII. Um, so making sure that your um, policies are in place, um, it's important. Um, it's important to add in when they're working remotely um, concerning, you know, what your expectations are of them. Um, I, um, I remember in the beginning, there was that virtual happy hour. Um, you know, the, a lot of employers are doing away with, with happy hour and um, uh, company-sponsored events that had alcohol. Why? Uh, because of the harassment claims that uh, sometimes came out of those events. Yet it was okay to have virtual happy hours. Um, probably not the smartest thing. Um, however, you know, with that being said, making sure that the anti-harassment policy talks about a complaint procedure and mechanism in place um, and making sure that all the employees know um, what, what they and where they can go if they feel they've been discriminated, uh, harassed, or retaliated in the workplace. Um, mandatory training, right? So mandatory training um, is uh, exists in certain states. It does not exist in other states. Um, I am a big believer in training. Um, we do it um, for our clients annually. And if we don't do it every year, if some of the clients wish to do the computer training, they, they hire us to do the live training um, every other year. Um, the computer training, I've seen it gone south. Everyone just goes enter, enter, enter. They get to the, the quiz at the end and they pass the quiz after the third time. Um, at least if someone is standing up in front of them, whether it be uh, remote or live, um, you're hoping that someone is actually paid attention just a bit more um, and that they learn the difference between um, you know, uh, not being nice to someone um, and harassing someone. Uh, I like to say that the, uh, dis the law against discrimination is not a code of civility. Not everyone has to be nice to you. Not everyone has to say good morning to you. However, um, you cannot and should not be harassed or discriminated uh, by any means uh, at the, um, in the place of the workplace. Uh, Cyberbullying um, does take place. Um, it happens over emails. It happens over text messages. Uh, private group chats, um, social media. Um, there is um, a, there is an uptick of verbal bullying on phone calls, um, uh, as well as the Zoom and the and the team calls. Uh, again, bullying versus harassment. Um, it's a fine line, um, but we need to make sure that it is addressed in the handbooks so that the culture of the employer. Um, and that it doesn't escalate to something, the culture of the employer uh, comes through and that it doesn't escalate to something that is unlawful. Um, so how do we make sure that we constantly check in with our people, making sure that, um, uh, that as, as management, um, that um, we make sure that there is no harassment um, making sure that uh, we are properly disciplining, uh, if need be, our employees, um, giving them feedback, um, making sure that um, uh, 
anything that our discussions with them uh, are fully documented. Look, even without face-to-face -face meetings or in-person conversations, um, it's extremely important to manage our employees so we can defend against any legal claims. Um, so it's checking in with the employees, uh, even if you don't see them. It's documenting um, your conversations. Um, employers are the worst at record keeping, we know that. Um, and that's usually what gets them in trouble. But we need to remember, record keeping doesn't mean a performance evaluation annually. Um, it could mean an email. It could mean, and that's that's all that documentation is. It could mean, uh, dear Stephanie, as we discussed yesterday at our meeting, um, you need to come to work promptly. Uh, you've been 10 minutes late uh, the past three days. Um, that's okay. That's enough documentation. That's that is, and you save it because what I don't want is again, I have my litigation hat on, is that when you are getting ready ready to fire Stephanie, Stephanie says, I had no idea that you're firing me because I'm late. No one ever told me. And now it's he said, she said. And if you had that email um, and you had that, uh, that um, whether it's an email memorializing the conversation uh, contemporaneously or um, uh, making sure that um, uh, we have a Zoom meeting about it. Um, and yes, uh, there are some employers that want to record those meetings. Again, we need to make sure that the law permits you to record meetings. Again, we need, if we are, we need to make sure there's a policy out there that tells the employee that at certain times or every time they're going to be recorded. Um, I don't really advise every time because I think that's probably bad culture, uh, but um, letting someone know. So again, so we're not shocked. And when that lawsuit comes saying, no, actually, the reason that I was fired is because I fit into all these protected classes. No one ever told me that I wasn't performing well. You have some sort of documentation. And again, um, it doesn't necessarily mean just because they're not in the same office as you are on the same address um, that you don't can't document um, whether or not it's performance issues that rises to the level of discipline or just performance issues that you wanna correct. Um, so a bit about kind of going to the pivoting to workplace investigations, um, which kind of speaks about discipline, uh, complaint procedures, harassment, discrimination. I will say that um, more and more the workplace investigations, that had an uptick. Um, and I'm going to tell you why, because I think not only um, is it um, good business practice when someone files a complaint to make sure that is properly investigated, um, but it also prevents and helps defense against lawsuits. So we used to say that it was just about good policies that were disseminated. And then the next was making sure that our employees were trained so that they knew that there was a complaint procedure. Well, now I think the next step is making sure that when there is a complaint, um, how do we investigate the complaint? It doesn't matter that it's remote. If, there's a, um, if there is a complaint, um, whether you keep that internally and an HR person, the CFO conducts a workplace investigation or you look to an outside source to conduct a workplace investigation, it can still be performed um, in the uh, era of uh, remote. Um, Zoom virtual interviews. Um, I'm a big fan of reading body language rather than phone interviews. Um, again, uh, looking at documentation and making sure that the documentation uh, is placed in appropriate files. Um, workplace investigations is a great um, defense. Again, the litigation hat on. Um, uh, but I will say that um, bad workplace investigations can also get the employer in trouble. So if it's not done thoroughly um, and it's, um, it's done one-sided and it's uh, uh, done um, really towards an eye just to um, protect the employer, um, that is a bad workplace investigation. Um, workplace investigators that conduct interviews even remotely uh, know how to uh, conduct them in a thorough and, and an efficient manner. Um, so out-of-state workers, um, conflicts, disputes, lawsuits, again, um, the questioning of which state employment laws apply to remote workers, it's fact-sensitive, implicating um, 
choice of law principles. Uh, employers, um, many, most I should say, uh, employees are at will employees, meaning that they don't have contracts. Um, they could be fired for any reason whatsoever, so long as it's uh, not a discriminatory reason. We also have uh, individual employment contracts, uh, and you also have um, uh, unionized employers, uh, employees, excuse me. Um, so it is important that when we are talking about whatever the employee is to make sure um, that there is a choice of law, whether it's in the handbook um, or in a separate agreement. Um, arbitration um, uh, agreements um, are being um, chipped away. Um, many employers like to use arbitration uh, mechanism as the disputes for um, employment issues. Um, the, uh, the, the, the federal um, law has recently said that um, uh, there's the FAA, um, which is the Federal Arbitration Act. Um, if agreements are governed by and subject to review under that, um, they are enforceable. Um, however, um, there are, for example, many states that are are carving out arbitration exceptions, uh, specifically in New Jersey, uh, sexual assault or sexual harassment claims cannot be arbitrated. That's not discrimination. That's you know that's sexual, uh, and that 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 is very distinct. Um, so what does that mean? Um, if you have an existing arbitration uh, policy uh, clause and it's kind of in the handbook somewhere on page 36. Get it out of page 36. It should be standalone. Uh, it should make sure that it has um, its a uh, separate document. Um, it should make sure that there's certain provision in there that the employee understands is signing off um, and make sure that it in a way mirrors uh, the state laws, um, but certainly can have uh, better protections for both sides um, uh, in the arbitration provisions. But whereas um, it used to be uh, on the uh, stuck in a handbook, uh, it should definitely come out and everyone should review their arbitrations if in fact they are requiring their employees uh, to bring all disputes uh, in the arbitration forum. Um, again, another some out of state um, implications um, with employees that are working remotely um, outside their usual office locations. You got to familiarize yourself with state and local employment laws of other jurisdictions. This is a very new concept. We need to consider workers' comp laws, unemployment leave laws, and other um, tax considerations. You know, all states have their own workers' compensation laws and their systems. Uh, businesses need to may need to establish workers' comp insurance accounts in each state um, in which they have employees working. Again, uh, as I say, this is not necessarily my lane, but this is something that you should address with your brokers. Um, you need to make sure, what I will say is that it's your responsibility to make sure that you have proper coverage um, for um, all your employees. Again, employers may need to have uh, unemployment accounts in each state um, where the employees work. This is something that you need to consider and familiarize yourself with. Um, sick leave, medical leave laws. Uh, New Jersey uh, requires, as we discussed earlier, uh, that employers provide sick leave and family leave in, in accordance with its statutes, uh, no matter where that employee is working. Employers need to consider income tax withholding. How about uh, receipt tax, sales? Uh, other tax implications. Um, what is tax nexus? It's used to describe a situation when a business has a tax presence or is doing business in a state other than its primary physical location. Uh, depending on what your remote out-of-state employees are doing, your business may be subject to that state's sales, income, or other, uh, other tax laws. Typically, employees pay taxes to the state in which they're physically located when they earn the income. If your company is in state A, but your employee lives and re works remotely in state B, then the employee must generally pay taxes to state B. That's unless the company is one of the seven convenience of the employer states. Uh, those are Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, Nebraska, New York, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. If your company is based in one of those states, then your employees must pay taxes where the company is located. The fact that New York is one of the convenience rule states means that New Jersey residents who commute to New York for work have been paying taxes to New York for quite some time, uh, even though now uh, they may be working out of their home from New Jersey. 
expense reimbursements. What expenses arise remotely? Uh, what is the federal law required? Uh, it only needs to reimburse employees for work-related expenses that drop their earnings below the minimum wage. However, it's about the state laws. Uh, and employers need to be familiar with the laws of the state that they are located regarding uh, this issue. Expenses can include the computers, phone, printer, paper, and other office supplies. We all in the kitchen or the break room have the legal postings. Uh, the federal and state laws require employers to post and disseminate uh, the, the, uh, the, the notifications. Employers are not relieved of their posting of notice requirements simply because employees are remote. So what should you do? Should you consider intranet postings or an email circulation of the notices? Should you still post in the kitchen if there's still a physical office? Should the guidance department of labor provide that employers may satisfy one-time notice requirements by email delivery if the employee customarily receives emails from the employer? What the Department of Labor doesn't tell you is, in, is that you must make sure that you also have some sort of documentation saying uh, that you emailed the employees and that they did receive such emails. Still hold the annual training regarding harassment and discrimination. Again, training still can be held. It should just be held via Zoom uh, or virtually, uh, whatever uh, the employer desires. Uh, enforce people to keep their screens on. Uh, speaking to someone that doesn't have their screen on, they'll be multitasking, we all know it. Uh, again, make it a workshop. Don't just speak at them. Make it a workshop so that there's some interaction and so that there is that they are learning. Not only does it prevent in, and help with the culture of the place of employment, uh, but it curtail, curtails any employment claims. Supervisors' responsibilities ensure that they're still available by phone and or virtually and ensure that you're regularly communicating with the employees and overseeing employee performance. Consider scheduling regular meetings. Uh, mandate that this, the supervisors do that. Mandate that they don't uh, just uh, highlight or pick on one group of people. Make sure that they schedule regular meetings um, with all their staff so that no one feels that they are being um, uh, picked on or uh, because of uh, whether or not they are fall within a protected class. And that's when the claims may or may not come uh, from the, the legal claims, as we say. All right, so let me, so let's get some takeaways real fast. Uh, and then I'm gonna go to some Q and A because my time is almost up. Uh, so remember proper policies, making sure the policies reflect the current state and the current environment that we live in. Uh, communicating to our staff, communicating to our employees, empowering the supervisors uh, to know what their roles are, making sure that you consider the federal and the state laws, the state laws uh, of where all the employees are working and whether or not you need to um, make sure that your policies are modified if they're working in a state uh, that must be addressed. Consider other uh, employment laws, the tax laws, the other workers' compensation laws, the unemployment laws that we spoke about, uh, whether and what they look like in other states. Um, consider where the office is located versus uh, where the employee is working from. Well, let me just grab some questions before I wrap this up. Um, New hires uh, who will be working remotely, should the hiring process differ from in-person hires? Uh, the answer is absolutely not. Uh, the only thing that is, is different um, is that you're going to be conducting uh, the, in, the, uh, the hiring process and the onboarding process um, uh, via remote. Take it a step back. How about before you hire that person? Um, you know, what about what questions uh, can you ask? Does it change uh, now that they're working remote uh, versus coming to the office? Um, no, there's still questions that you can't ask. Uh, there are certain questions out there that are unlawful questions uh, that you uh, are not permitted to ask about potential to potential applicants. Some states actually have 
uh, series of uh, issues and questions that you can ask. Um, but what's interesting is, um, and I know that people are now asking questions about familiarity with technology or their communication skills. Those are skills that uh, the employees, now that they're working remotely, um, must, must um, probably a bit more, uh, have a bit more than when they came to the office. Uh, can my employee, even though they're fully remote, still hire, uh, sorry, still file a workplace harassment claim? Absolutely. Um, they can uh, file a workplace harassment claim. Cyber and verbal harassment can still exist um, and lead to a uh, workplace harassment, whether it's an internal complaint or a lawsuit. Uh, depending on uh, where that person is located, depending on what your policy says, um, it depends on where that uh, lawsuit uh, may be filed, but absolutely an employee can still file a workplace harassment claim. The idea is to um, hopefully uh, uh, eliminate the claim by conducting a thorough workplace investigation um, that hopefully uh, doesn't uh, have it rise to the level of a civil lawsuit. Uh, let's see. Um, as an employer, are you required to reimburse employees for work-related expenses incurred from working from home remotely? We did have a slide on that. Under the federal law, the answer is no, um, unless uh, the work-related expenses drop the employee's earnings below the minimum wage. Um, most states also uh, do not require reimbursement, but the laws vary. Uh, by each state. So one just needs to be familiar as to um, where you're located and where the business is located in. And, you know, consider community expenses versus remote work expenses when you're coming up with um, uh, uh, that policy as well. Let's see. I'm going to do one more question. That's all I think I have time for. Um, if my employee is fully remote, um, can my employee file a workers' compensation claim? Uh, absolutely. Uh, if an employee is injured at home um, or at a remote location while performing the functions of the job, the employee can file a claim for workers' compensation. Uh, it's certainly a higher burden, um, but that's why, again, uh, we should go back to what are your expectations uh, for uh, the workday? Um, do you require them to log off for um, an, an hour for lunch? Uh, set those expectations um, so that, you know, what I've seen is, um, well, I took a two o'clock lunch and I was in the car, you know, and the question is, was that person in a two o'clock lunch for the job or were they picking up their kids? Um, so again, but workplace compensation claims still exist. They're not going anywhere. Um, there are employees out there that do file work, work, workman's compensation claims, even if they got hurt in their home, if they were in fact um, on the job. Katie, I, th I think my time is up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So much valuable information. Um, so any questions that were not able to be answered on today's program? We'll receive a response via email. Um, the MPHR team is here to help guide your organization on any HR issues. If you'd like to learn more about how we can assist your organization, please visit our website to set up, set up a short 15 minute call. Be sure to join us next week on the same day and time for our webinar on wage and hour, conducting internal audits and maintaining compliance. Visit our website to register and to see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. We will be sending out the recording of today's webinar along with the presentation slides this afternoon. Thanks again, Stephanie, and thank you for joining us and have a terrific day. Thank you, everyone.